Instead of tossing out stale bread, you could always use it to make what Victorians called toast water. This, unfortunately, is exactly what its name suggests. Instead of steeping tea leaves in boiling water, you steep a piece of toast. Once the water has completely cooled, remove the soggy starch, strain the water, and serve. Certain recipes listed ways to gussy it up, like adding cream and sugar, or an apple baked with brown sugar. According to the 1884 edition of the Annals of Hygiene, some persons, particularly old gentlemen, like toast water warm and sweetened with good molasses. But in her 1861 classic, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, author Isabella Mary Beaton specified that toast water should only ever be served cold. As for the taste, food writer Kat Kinsman tested Mrs. Beaton's recipe in 2016 and described it as tasting like a pond that is haunted by the ghost of toast that drowned in it. But let's find out for ourselves, shall we? Cheers. Um, it's, it's, it's toast water. <laughs> when it comes to old-timey life hacks, turning bread into a supposedly refreshing beverage is on the milder side. Other well-intentioned tips and tricks are more disgusting, more dangerous, or both. Today I'm covering some of the most memorable ones, from raw beef for wrinkle prevention to cleaning paintings with potatoes. Kids, it's probably best not to try these at home. In her 1867 book, The Family Save All, Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson supplied readers with a homegrown cure for chapped hands. Here's what it called for. A quarter pound of hog's lard, rinsed first in water and then in rose water. The yolks of two new laid eggs, a large spoonful of honey, and almond paste or ground oatmeal, your choice. Spread the mixture all over your hands and that's it. Carry on about your day with greasy and possibly germy fingers. Hey, at least they're not dry anymore. The Family Save All also had a DIY idea for people who couldn't afford nice feather beds. Go outside on a crisp fall day, find the nearest beech tree, and gather a bunch of its driest leaves to stuff in your mattress. Why beech? These leaves are, quote, very elastic and will not harbor vermin. But people who could afford feather beds needed to make sure the feathers had fully dried out before they tucked themselves in. Otherwise, they'd risk catching chill or rheumatism, according to Ms. Leslie's Ladies House Book, published in 1850. Author Eliza Leslie recommended leaving a new bed out in the hot sun or by the stove for a few days before moving it to the bedroom. Leslie had a nifty way to detect dampness, too. Place a warming pan beneath the sheets and as soon as you remove it, stick an upside down drinking glass in its place. If the inside clouds up with condensation, sorry, you are the father. I mean, your mattress is damp. To keep hair from ending up in your food, Leslie offered a simple fix. Don't put a mirror in your kitchen, as it is a temptation for the domestics to comb or arrange their hair. In houses where there is a kitchen looking glass, hairs are frequently found in the dishes that come to table. The kitchen staff, Leslie explained, should only ever fix their hair in their own rooms. And don't worry about shelling out for wallpaper in their quarters. According to Hervey J. Siemens' 1899 book, The Expert Cleaner, those walls were the perfect opportunity to make DIY wallpaper out of your old illustrated newspapers. The cook will appreciate this more than if it were done in the finest cartridge paper, Seaman claimed. Something tells me he didn't ask too many cooks for their opinions before writing that. Some of Seaman's cooking tips stretched the bounds of food safety, to put it mildly. To prolong the shelf life of meat that's already begun to go bad, Seaman advises simply putting it outside in the cool night air. If a raccoon steals it, well, that's probably for the best. If your cream or milk is starting to go sour, Seaman recommends adding a generous pinch of borax per quart. Borax was a popular food preservative at the time, but its days were numbered. In 1902, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's chief chemist, Harvey W. Wiley, enlisted volunteers to consume foods with certain chemicals so he could determine if they were harmful. Borax was found to cause everything from gastrointestinal distress to vomiting, depending on the dose. Wiley's experiments were one of the reasons the federal government decided to better regulate the food and drug industry. In 1906, it passed the Pure Food and Drugs Act, which established the Food and Drug Administration. Wiley became its first commissioner, and borax is on the FDA's list of banned food additives to this day. So if you think your milk smells funky, skip the borax and just pour it down the drain. Or on your kitchen floor. In the Victorian era, some people thought milk made for a great floor cleaner. According to English Heritage, an organization that manages hundreds of historic sites across the UK, this actually works as long as it's a non-porous stone floor. While Broadsworth Hall near Doncaster was closed during the pandemic, conservation has tried washing its stone floors with three different kinds of milk, full fat, semi-skimmed, and skim. 
Skim worked the best. Amber Xavier Rowe, head of collections conservation at English Heritage, told The Guardian that they'd probably even use it again. The team also saw success with another Victorian tactic, sponging down grimy wallpaper with bread. According to Xavier Rowe, it does work, although it does need to be fresh white bread. Stale bread would be too abrasive. I tried it with some of my sourdough and it was surprisingly effective. It's very gentle. You just gotta vacuum your crumbs up. To restore old oil paintings, there are a couple of old fashioned tips that English Heritage doesn't recommend. One, wiping them down with a wet slice of raw potato. And two, placing them in direct sunlight in order to kill mold. These will likely do more harm than good. In 1858, Robert Kemp Philp published a book titled Inquire Within for Anything You Want to Know, or Over 3,700 Facts Worth Knowing. Might have to borrow that title for a future mental floss video. If you were inquiring within about a DIY laundry detergent for silks and satins, here's what you'd find. Four ounces of soft soap, four ounces of honey, one egg white, and one wine glass full of gin. Using that concoction, the clothing should be scoured thoroughly with a rather hard brush, rinsed and ironed out whilst quite damp. If that doesn't go against everything you've ever learned about washing delicates, I don't know what does. 19th century homemakers didn't just use egg whites to ruin, I, I mean launder, their clothes. They also mixed them with quicksilver to kill bed bugs. Quicksilver is another name for mercury, the hazardous liquid metal that used to be common in thermometers. If mercury is exposed to room temperature air, it starts evaporating, turning into a colorless, odorless vapor. When inhaled, it can cause all sorts of adverse effects from chest pain to vomiting. In her 1838 book, The American Frugal Housewife, Lydia Maria Child at least included a warning with her quicksilver and egg concoction. What is left should be thrown away. It is dangerous to have it about the house. Plenty of Child's other tips have actually now become the norm. She suggested sprinkling salt on ice-covered front steps, for example, and said you should always clean your teeth before bed. Other ideas from the time failed to catch on. If you ran out of coffee beans, Child discussed roasting peas, rum-soaked rye grain, or dry brown bread crusts. For what it's worth, she also said, none of these are very good. But she swore by the effectiveness of earwax as a pain reliever, specifically for wounds inflicted by nails or other long pointy items. She also recommended slathering earwax all over your cracked lips. I think I'd rather just have cracked lips. Forget fancy serums or Botox to keep wrinkles at bay. How about just sleeping with raw beef on your face? According to Lola Montez's 1858 book, The Secrets of Beauty, or Secrets of a Lady's Toilet, that's what many fashionable ladies in Paris used to do. Every night, she wrote, they would bind their faces with thin slices of raw beef, which is said to keep the skin from wrinkles, while it gives a youthful freshness and brilliancy to the complexion. I have no doubt of its efficacy. I, on the other hand, have some doubts. Montez concluded her book with a section called Hints to Gentlemen on the Art of Fascinating, which features this irresistible pickup line. You may ask her if she is always particular to shut her eyes on retiring to bed. She will ask, why? And you will answer, because if you do not, I fear that the brightness of your eyes will burn holes in the blanket or set the house afire. Wondering how to make your eyes sparkle enough to merit that compliment? 19th century women dropped everything from perfume to citrus juice in their peepers. Belladonna was also common, which optometrists actually still use today in drops that make patients' pupils dilate. Ingesting just a couple of berries is enough to kill a child, and even consuming a small amount could possibly make you hallucinate or put you in a coma. Barkham Burroughs recommended a somewhat safer hack for sparkling eyes in his 1889 Encyclopedia of Astounding Facts and Useful Information. Dash soap suds into them. Say your face got a little too sun-kissed during your last trip to the beach. Here's a way to fade your tan fast, courtesy of the book The Young Housekeeper as Daughter, Wife, and Mother. Soak some unripe grapes in water and add in a little alum and salt. After that, wrap the grapes in paper and roast the whole bundle in hot ashes. Then squeeze out the juice and wash the face with it every morning. It will soon remove the tan. For removing freckles, there are several recipes in the 1901 book Beauty's Aids, or How to Be Beautiful, written by the anonymous Countess C. One concoction contains camphor, almond oil, and half a pint of turpentine. Another calls for hog's lard, zinc, and crystallized lead. Yet another involves mixing milk and hydrochloric acid, among other substances. Hydrochloric acid can cause chemical burns, and lead is, well, lead. Turpentine can be a skin irritant too, and if it gets in your eyes, you could end up with corneal ulcers that cause blindness. Countess C's cure for a head cold is similarly ill-advised. Mix menthol, cocaine, and boracic acid, aka boric acid, which is poisonous, and snort it. 
To Countess C's credit, that would probably make you less concerned with your cold. If you bought a pack of Gallagher cigarettes in the early 20th century, you might find a little card inside with a life hack printed on it. These handy how-tos covered everything from lighting a match in the wind to drawing a duck without lifting your pencil. You know, for all the times in your life when you've wished you knew how to do that. This is no friggin' hack. Okay, I can do it. <laughs> to find out if your butter is actually margarine hiding in plain sight, one Gallagher's card recommended smearing some on a piece of paper and then setting it on fire. According to Gallagher's copywriters, pure butter emits a dainty and agreeable odor while margarine gives off an unpleasant tallowy smell. Here's how to relieve pain from chillblains, which are itchy and or blistered patches of skin that occur when small blood vessels get inflamed after overexposure to cold. Just rub the area with an apple slice covered in salt. And be sure to use a good juicy apple. To clear mucus from your nose or throat, literally just snort salt and then gargle warm water. Today's physicians would rather you mix the salt and water before you put it up your nose, just FYI. Here's how Gallagher's recommends building up your lung capacity. Every morning and night, stand on your toes, tip your head far back, and take really deep breaths, exhaling slowly and allowing the chest to sink first, followed by the lungs. Or maybe don't smoke cigarettes in the first place. It looks like a pigeon. <laughs> We've got an upcoming episode on the deadliest toys in history. Drop a comment down below if you've played with a killer toy and live to tell the tale. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.